they gone? You see, after the Napoleonic Wars, this part of Belgium was attacked by plunderers who killed the men, raped the women, torched the houses, stole the property. And that was on a good day. Chateau d'Atre stands on the site of a medieval castle which belonged to the Gomini family. The house was built by Francois Philippe Joseph Franot, the Count of Gomini, but the interiors are the work of his son Francois Ferdinand, Councillor of State to the Holy Roman Empire. The joy of Chateau d'Atre is that it's here for every passerby to admire. It's not like an English house set in the middle of a great park in its own world. Here, everybody who drives past suddenly gets this glimpse of this grand house. And as with typical French chateau, it had originally two courtyards, an avant cour and a cour d'honneur. And between the two were these two delightful little pavilions, and they were linked by great iron railings. But then, what you see today is really a tribute to another invention, the lawnmower. Instead of formal paving and gravel. Now you have this wonderful lawn, this beautiful clip topiary, pyramids and cones, marshals and exact pairs all the way up. And then this lovely parterre in the form of a fleur-de-lis right in front of the chateau. Couldn't help noticing these rather unusual sphinxes. But they're a matching pair and as you see, they have these very pretty human faces. And they represent the two mistresses of Louis XV, one of them, Madame de Pompadour. It seems rather odd, perhaps, to have the king's mistresses beside your front door, but you find this at really quite a number of chateaux, a few in France, one or two even in England. Uh, it was a popular, very unusual sculpture, which was obviously copied quite a number of times. And here, on the garden front, you have these very beautiful, what's called parterre de broderie. You can see the box hedging in these elaborate, complicated curves. And then today, another touch, they're growing tobacco. And then over there behind us is the dovecot, that every seigneurial house had a dovecot. And this one had 3,800 nesting boxes. And the doves here, unusually, were red. And of course, they were used in the 18th century. They used to eat them sometimes. They also used them as messengers. But the bigger the dovecot, the grander a seigneur you were. This would be a wonderful house to wake up in in the morning. It faces east and it has these huge windows, very tall, on both floors, the, the main floor and the bedroom floor above. And you have these very typical French casement windows. Unlike the English sash, which goes up and down, the French casements always open in pairs. And these are perfect examples of their date. 1752 is on the facade, and the woodwork of these windows, really quite chunky, is exactly of that date. And that's the message of this whole house. It is a complete period piece of the middle of the 18th century, one of the most delightful periods in the whole of European decorative arts. with the sun streaming in. It's the grand saloon, but it's also very much a summer room. It's a celebration of the outdoors. The ceiling is in plasterwork, but the motif are these trailing flowers. And these Italian plasterers were celebrating life outside nature, because in the cornice all around the room, you have these garlands of flowers, but sitting on them are birds and mice and squirrels. You might actually be out of doors. And they had a sense of humor because they actually portrayed themselves as little monkeys. Above the door, you can see them with the sculptor's tools finishing off the plaster work. The other great motif of this room are these big wool paintings. 
are in the style of the French court painter Hubert Robert. Now, 20 or 30 years earlier, this room would have been hung with tapestries. But now you have these great murals, and they celebrate the 18th century's love affair with ancient Rome and Greece. So you have a port scene with classical ruins, and in addition, something which celebrates a recent discovery, the discovery of Palmyra in Syria, the great ruins there. You can see all these men with turbans, obviously in the desert. And then elsewhere on the walls, there are scenes in the Roman Campania, the countryside with Roman soldiers. But it wasn't only a summer room, because you notice there are two fireplaces, the sign of a very grand room, and above them, the symbols of fire, the phoenix, the symbol also of the rebuilding of this house, and the salamander. And what makes this room a period piece in other ways is this wonderful floor. You can see the compass motif right in the center, perfect French style parquet floor, and the furniture. Again, it's cane furniture, very much summer furniture, but it's all en suite, painted, not gilded, but you have the cane-backed seats and the cane-backed sofas, all matching, all part of the original furniture of the house. These rooms were decorated for the son of the builder, Francois Ferdinand, Comte de Gomigny, and he was Chamberlain to the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II. And his governor in the Low Countries here was Marie Christine, the sister of Marie Antoinette. And you have a nice connection here because she often came to the house. And the chandelier above us is a Viennese one. It's not only in glass, but in amethyst. It's a room made for entertaining. In the corners are these trophies of musical instruments. The modeling is very shallow, but perfectly crisp. There are violins, lars, there are the actual strings, are perfectly delicate and crisp, the pages of music. You can you can see the notes. And the other striking point in this room are the doors. Dark wood, beautifully carved. But if you notice, the panels aren't square as they usually are. They are in these extraordinary S and C curves. And this announces the Rococo. The Rococo was all asymmetry. And its trademark was rocaille, or shell work. And at the top of each panel is this wonderful carved piece of shell work. And the Grand Saloon was just part of a series of rooms, wasn't it? Well, here is an enfilade. This was one of the great features of 18th century houses. A series of rooms which open one into the other. You walk through one saloon into a second. And at the end were always little cabinets where they came to talk, so, play cards. And admire the wallpaper, I imagine. Well, actually, it's Chinese hand-painted silk. One of the members of the family had a stake in the Ostend Shipping Company, which traded a lot with the East Indies. And this silk came in rolls. And though it was hand-painted, each roll is identical, so they can be hung, so they exactly match. But more than this, the whole room was en suite, that this material was used also for the chairs, the window seats, and the curtains. And in the 18th century, they spent almost as much on fringes and tassels as they did on curtains. If you look at these curtains, you can see they were never meant to be drawn. Instead, there were these hanging blinds. And the curtains from the start were perfectly folded, and each fold has its own layer of fringe, and then the cords with the tassels, these great, chunky, bell-shaped tassels. And then if you look at the tops, the valances, perfectly scalloped with more tassels, and these great buns at the corners. And they even did the bell pulls on either side of the chimney piece. These were padded with cotton wool and also entirely covered in silk, but the silk has naturally perished. Now, what's fascinating is that this silk has inevitably faded, but here we have a roll of the original silk which was in a cupboard or a drawer, and as a result, it is absolutely perfect in color. So this room would have been startlingly bright, this wonderful, vivid yellow. You can see the hand-painted flowers, the little birds, these striking blues. They say it took 30 years to complete the carving in this house. If 
you look at the overdoors, there is wonderful panels carved from solid wood. You see the bunches of grapes, the pheasants, the game they could shoot in the park. And even if you look at the pilasters in the room, they decorated those, the flutes, little recesses which run up these pilasters are usually entirely plain, but at the bottoms you see these wonderful carved flowers, and then again from the top, these little garlands hanging down in each one. And when you finished admiring all the fancy fabrics, well, you could always try to unravel the mystery of this fantastic floor. Marie Antoinette's sister, Marie Christine, was married to a German duke, hence the name, the Salon des Archiducs. And you can see it's a man's room from this splendid plasterwork trophy over the fireplace, a hunting trophy with guns and a great stag's head. And the two sisters are shown in these beautiful 18th century busts, little biscuit porcelain busts, one on the right, of Marie Christine and then Marie Antoinette with the fleur de lis of France in her hair. And also in this room is a portrait of the builder of the house, the Comte de Gomigny. And you have further evidence here of the time it took to complete the decoration. Because if you look at the panels over the doors at the top, you can see the Rococo shell work, typical of the reign of Louis XV of France. And then below, a classical urn, which is typical of his successor, Louis XVI. This handsome painted clock over the fireplace again has this mixture of the two styles, some Rococo and then some more geometric work, typical of Louis XVI. And as always, the elaborate gilt bronze mounts, which are the trademark of French furniture and decoration. On the walls survives the original wallpaper, 18th century wallpaper, probably French. And you can see that it was printed in blocks. They didn't do it in rows in those days. They did one block after another and then pasted them together so that they became rolls which could then be hung on the walls. Preserved in the room is a roll of the original paper, completely unfaded. It was on a bright white background and here are the highlights of gilt, which have faded on the walls, but here are as bright and crisp as on the day they were printed. One of the trademarks of Belgium, the Low Countries, these great hunting pieces by Peter Paul Rubens and his school. The dead birds which have been shot, the deer, quite a gory scene when you start looking at it but nonetheless painted with great brio. And these were to be found not only in houses here in Belgium, but all over Europe. They were immensely popular at the time. They were above all pictures which people hadn't had dining rooms, but it showed that you, the owner, were a great sportsman. This was the bedroom of Mary Christine, the Archduchess, and she would receive here. She would be sitting up in bed and visitors would be brought to her to talk to her in bed, or sometimes there was the ceremony of the levee. She would actually dress in front of certain privileged people. And the bed is, as always is in these grand French rooms, in the recess, set back so you could put a curtain across it, be completely private and quiet. Then on either side, these doors and they open into little cabinets where you could put clothes, where you could wash. But they're always connected with other doors behind, in this case to a little staircase which went upstairs so you could actually go on quiet assignations upstairs unknown to anybody else in the house. <laughs>
this is not so much a staircase, more an art gallery. It's hung with landscapes, portraits, including one of the Emperor Charles VI. And at the top are these two handsome grisailles. That's monochrome paintings of the chateau. One shows the old house which stood on the site, and the other shows the proud new house with its cordonneur. Now, this staircase might have come out of a French pattern book. Architects used to publish these books of designs in the 18th century. And here we have as well this wonderful balustrade. You can see, once again, it's Rococo, the S and the C curves, and the hint of shell work. And then all sweeping round in this tremendous curve at the end, with a sunflower right in the middle. Two halls, Marcus. One for the staircase and one for the entrance. But this doubles as a chapel. A chapel? A chapel? Where is the altar? Where are the candlesticks? Well, give me a hand. Help open this door. Oh, it's walked a bit since 1752. Mm. And here is the chapel. See, it's fully equipped, ready for communion. And what was nice about it was, if any member of the family was ill, they could listen in upstairs, because there's, there's a little slit up there, like a letterbox, and they could hear every word of the service. What a nice touch. And we have also here a wonderful floor. See all these different marbles. They were brought from the nearby chateau of Combron Casto. It was an abbey which had been demolished, and the materials were reused here even brought some columns, which they put beside the bridge over the entrance. Every 18th century nobleman had a park and a pleasure ground where he could take his guests walking. And these parks were often filled with temples and follies, classical ruins. But then later in the 18th century came the romantic movement, the return to nature, and they wanted a more naturalistic style. They wanted caves and rocks, precipices, even artificial mountains. This was a rock built entirely by men. They worked for eight years, 40 men, 18 horses, brought this great construction stone by stone. It's not artificial stonework. These are real stones piled on high, it's like, like some great construction of the giants. Why? It was built as a belvedere, or viewing platform, for the Archduchess when she came to watch the hunt. It was an enormous feat, one of the biggest follies ever constructed by a landowner. It was designed to look like a relic of prehistoric times, these great rocks and boulders framing cave entrances with great jagged stones pointing in. It's as if it's frozen in the moment of actual collapse, as a, a vengeful god had hurled a thunderbolt at it, and the whole structure is collapsing, and these rocks are pressing down upon us. Yet this moment has been frozen. It's here forever, frightening us, intimidating us. Marcus? 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 For me, Chateau Dutch is a great house because it's a perfect 
period piece. Here you can see all the decorative arts over 30 years, and all great houses should have one mad extravagance. And in this case, it is this extraordinary folly in the park, a folly which has almost been forgotten, but which we've refound, discovered, a great excitement about these houses is that however well-known they are, there's always something new to be discovered. And that makes Chateau Dutch one of the great houses of Europe. Chateau d'Atre is 45 minutes drive from the centre of Brussels. Take the Brussels ring road to the south in the direction of Howe, then follow the road to Atre, midway between Brussels and Lille.